Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Benvenuti a tutti. Buongiorno a tutti. Welcome to this conference. And the foundation is 10 years old, and this is the seventh time that we have an event dedicated to the region. And of course, we are very happy that this time we can have public in presence. In other words, we have taken the habit of holding every year a project dedicated to the Arab region, and we like to continue this tradition. Since the beginning of the NATO Defense College Foundation, we have a strong focus, focus on Arab affairs, and we try to assess the situation in the best possible way. As I said in other occasions, our objective is that we would like to see the region transformed in an arc of opportunities, using in a positive way its potential. It is impossible, clearly, to resume such a vast area in simple formulas, because it's clear that each country has its own history and expectations and deserves a special attention. What can we say this year? A fresh look is necessary, because we see a mix of old factors and new movements. We like to think that those movements go in the direction of stability and of more cooper regional cooperation. We know by experience that regional cooperation is one of the basic problems in the region. Now, my major changes taking place in the last year include a new government in Israel, the welcome recomposition of the Gulf Cooperation Council, the so-called Abraham Agreements, among various players, and perhaps also a pattern of reconciliation among old adversaries. And we wish to extend a friendly hand in good faith in order to offer support and advice. NATO has started to establish partnership in the region since 1994, with the main wish of projecting security and supporting, where it is possible, the efforts of local governments. It is a quiet strategy, and I have been personally involved in its inception. Today, we are going to direct our attention also on what we call Deep Maghreb. By this, we mean the vast strategic region, south of the Mediterranean, down to the Atlantic and the Sahara, that includes its Sahel dimension. At the east, Libya is contiguous and is in permanent turmoil since 2011. The situation in this area that comprises a number of weak and poor countries is unfortunately working, worsening since some time already. A deadly combination of illegal trafficking of all kinds, from cigarettes to narcotics and organized crime, is affecting the region in serious ways. The combination includes terrorist levels that sometimes are a cover for illegal activities and such an unrest and disorder represent a major threat to stability and well-being. Dangerous connections with Libya and its hinterland complete the scenario. The international community, the European Union and NATO, in perspective, are engaged in difficult choices to confront a political situation that cannot be tackled anymore in traditional ways. Various initiatives are underway, and it is clear that a major investment is needed covering various aspects. The first subject today is energy in its evolution, complexity, and the implications for the region, both financial, economic, and political. We have been able today to have a number of very distinguished speakers and moderators coming from a number of countries, and I thank you all for having accepted our invitation in Rome. And I know that for some of you, there has been a difficult travel. In our tradition, we wish to provide a good framework for a high-level scientific conversation, even coming from different perspectives. Our objective is to connect with a larger audience on strategic issues, and in our own way, we complement the work done by the college. We live in a very engaging times with a where a clever analysis and a better understanding is more important than ever, and information is at the basis of everything. I wish to thank from my heart, the small but very able staff of the foundation 
for their hard work in preparation of this conference, which I repeat is the first time this is really legal in presence, which is, requires a special effort. Special thanks very warmly go to those friends who supported us with generosity, old friends. Philip Morris International first, the NATO Political and Security Division, with also personal friends, La Compagnia di San Paolo, and our partners, the Policy Center for the New South, and of course, the College. My sincere thanks go also to our traditional media partners, for me and their press. And I think that uh, this is uh, the beginning of the conference. I wish everybody a good afternoon. Auguro buon pomeriggio a tutti. Grazie. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. As the, uh, the commandant of the uh, NATO Defense College, it's indeed a great pleasure to welcome speakers, chairs, and participants to this conference about Arab Geopolitics 2021, organized by the NATO Defense College Foundation with the support of several partners. The college is always delighted uh, to support the foundation efforts to promote debates and disseminate knowledge about topics of primary interest for NATO. With that respect, I consider the Foundation's initiatives complementary to the NDC educational and research activities. My particular thanks to Ambassador Minuto Rizzo and his team for arranging such important events, managing to gather such a distinguished audience of practitioners, academics and decision makers around issues of importance for the transatlantic security. In times of high uncertainties, it is critical to share perspectives and experiences and try to identify candidly some lessons from our past engagements to be prepared to face future challenges. In the light of the withdrawal from Afghanistan, it is more than even necessary to assess the strategic impact of NATO's crisis management initiatives. Assessing the Alliance endeavors in that country over the last 20 years should not lead the Allies to disengage from the broad MENA region. On the contrary, the Middle East, North Africa, and the Sahel regions remain deeply affected by various forms of instability. One decade after the Arab Spring, the region has not witnessed the expected socio-economic and political reforms claimed by the popular movements of 2011. The so-called Arab Spring has paved the way to an overall worsening of the security situation in NATO's south. Countries like Libya, Syria, Yemen have fallen into civil wars facing major humanitarian crises. Iraq and Lebanon struggle with major socio-economic troubles constantly threatened by bankruptcy and sectarian tensions. Legitimacy of governments and leaderships are regularly contested in Algeria, Tunisia and Egypt. Even in the Gulf countries, political stability and social cohesion were put at stake by the need for economic diversification and the COVID crisis. In a regional context polarized by rivalries with Iran and the American disengagement. At the same time, the recent war in Gaza has recalled the explosive potential of status quo. Despite the prospect for rapprochement and cooperation created by the normalization agreement between Israel and its Arab neighbors, the Palestinian cause keeps its importance for public opinion all over the region. The hardening of the situation in Sahel, aggravated by the internationalization and fragmentation in Libya, reflects the growing role of non-state actors in violence dynamics in the south. Everywhere in the Sahel region, governance discrepancies, community grievances and marginalization have provided a breeding ground for the development of violent extremist organizations and illegal trafficking activities, with the tragic humanitarian consequences we all know. In that fragile context, the climate change raises new challenges and might increase the pressure on natural resources available. So NATO South is affected by multiple drivers of instability that have serious security implications for the Allied security, as illustrated by the growing tensions in the Mediterranean basin. The strengthened influence of Russia 
and China in the Middle East, North Africa region, and in Africa, generally speaking, through arms deals, expanding military and economic footprint, to, many, to name a few, as well as the presence of new actors, such as the Gulf countries, have put NATO's allies' interests in the region at risk. All these developments pledge for a renewed attention of the NATO community to the South, monitoring main trends and analyzing their implications for the Alliance and its partners in the region. With that in mind, speakers and participants will have the opportunity today to firstly evaluate the changes that occurred in the region over the last years, trying to identify how regional actors and global powers are shifting and reorganizing their alliances, then to take some time to examine the new challenges posed by the evolution of energy markets and resources. And finally, the last panel will focus on dynamics in the deep Maghreb, this regional ensemble that links the Maghreb countries of the Mediterranean with the Sand Sea of Sahel, across several trafficking routes controlled by organized crime and other non-state actors. We need to understand what resources, forces, and strategies should be employed to avoid a major regional collapse in the Maghreb Sahel region or prevent further exacerbation of rivalries in the Middle East, as instability in both regions have direct consequences for the Alliance security. Revealing and discuss how we might meet these challenges is our task today. Let me extend the warmest possible welcome to all participants. And again, a heartfelt thanks to the Foundation and to Mr. Russo Perez from the Compagnia di San Paolo for this wonderful opportunity to discuss and learn together. Thank you. Thank you, General. Uh, now I have the pleasure to give the floor is a strange way of expressing ourselves because uh, we are going to listen to uh, Nicolò Russo Perez, uh, uh, Fondazione Compagnia di San Paolo, uh, a supporter, a very welcome supporter of, a, of the foundation and also a personal friend who could not join us in person, but he's there, I can see him. So I give the floor to you, Nicolò. Welcome, buongiorno, ben arrivato. Puoi parlare. Mi, potete, mi sentite bene? Sì. You can hear me well. So good afternoon and, uh, and welcome uh, uh, to all the participants, I'm Nicolò Russo Perez, and uh, I have the pleasure of uh, representing the Fondazione Compagnia di San Paolo in today's event. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the, the organizer, the NATO Defense College Foundation and the NATO Defense College. Uh, I would like to stress uh, the importance of this cooperation within the Compagnia and the NATO Defense College Foundation, since uh, it is very timely. Uh, NATO is in a process of uh, important transformation and uh, adaptation uh, with the NATO 2030 process. And therefore, I think uh, that there is a, a huge opportunity for think tanks, uh, for the scientific and academic community to contribute uh, to the design of uh, the NATO of, of the future. The so-called southern flank uh, with Sahel and North Africa represent an increasingly uh, contested uh, regional security complex. Uh, where we see the influence of uh, external powers like Russia and, and China that is growing. Um, these regions are deeply connected uh, with the greater Middle East, uh, which remains plugged by rivalries uh, among various states uh, involved in ongoing conflicts and, and crises from, from Libya, Libya to Afghanistan, to Syria, Iraq and Yemen. Against this backdrop, uh, the multiple linkages between local, national and regional actors uh, are becoming more complex and multifaceted with a direct impact on the character of, of warfare. Uh, on the one hand, uh, given the involvement of regional powers uh, in uh, proxy wars, uh, although the region has seen uh, a normalization between uh, some Gulf Cooperation Council states and Israel, escalation is possible, uh, both through spectrum of conflict and across uh, various operational theaters, both uh, land and, and maritime. On the other hand, uh, terrorist groups and militias can access uh, robust military capabilities, uh, financial resources, uh, and also logistical support, uh, which enable them uh, to challenge the security forces of NATO partners. Um, easy, accessible, relatively inexpensive uh, technologies uh, 
further amplify the possibilities of local and regional actors from uh, unmanned aerial system to information and communication technologies used for training, for intelligence, uh, for propaganda, and also for fundraising. Uh, such situation presents uh, several implications for NATO and its partner in the region, including those uh, part of the Mediterranean Dialogue and uh, of the Istanbul Cooperation Initiative. Um, the Alliance has to deal with the geopolitical approaches of relevant actors in the region, as well as with different posture among NATO allies. Uh, the current US administration may help in this regard insofar as it seems to support a more regional balance and cooperation. And uh, this also could uh, pave the way for further coordination uh, and, and uh, coordinated efforts uh, by Europeans, uh, be it through NATO, the EU, or a combination of both uh, and uh, ad hoc uh, groupings. So, and, and here I conclude my, my remarks. I look very much forward to understanding more from the internationally renewed experts that are joining us today. Thanks again to the NATO Defense College Foundation for the organization of the event, and in particular, to the, its president, Ambassador Alessandro Minuto Rizzo. This is an event uh, that we at the Compagnia di San Paolo Foundation, a private sector player, we consider of strategic importance uh, to fostering uh, a better understanding uh, of the geopolitical context uh, in which uh, all our societies are embedded. Uh, I wish you all a fruitful conversation. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Nicolò. Grazie, Nicolò. Thank you for your very good remarks. Uh, it's very kind of you to have supported us and very kind of you to have these welcome remarks together with me. Thank you again. Uh, and now let's start with the real, I mean, uh, panel, can I say, the real stuff in a way. Uh, and we have a first panel uh, chaired by an old friend and a very distinguished scholar, uh, Spencer, so I think you can come here and start and start with your uh, speakers to to work on the on the subject of the first panel. Well, thank you very much, um, Alessandro. I know that we've got a lot to get through this afternoon, so I'm very grateful to the opening speakers for having given us such a wide panorama of not just the challenges facing the region, but also the challenges for external policymakers trying to make sense of it, and particularly for NATO policymakers to restructure and rethink about engagement in the region. So I have my own views on this, but you may hear some of these coming out in the question and answer session. There'll be plenty of time for you in the audience and also those watching online um, to pose questions. But we'll start off straight away um, with my panel of all the ambassadors. I'm pleased to say uh, all three of them here president, present and um, Ambassador Oded Iran, who will be joining us uh, virtually from Israel, have all served as ambassadors and therefore should have some idea of the tricky nature of policy making. Uh, but first up is uh, Marco Carnelos, who's very kindly agreed, I believe, to give a view from Washington to see how things look from the US, which is putting yourself in the place of another, but I think from the experience of um, long interactions with the Americans in your service. Um, he's currently uh, running and set up his own um, consultancy, MC Geo Policy, um, since 2008. After 25 years as an Italian diplomat serving in Somalia, Australia, the UN in New York, and also in Iraq, he's also been a policy advisor to no less than three Italian prime ministers. So over to you first, Marco. Good afternoon, and thank you very much to the Foundation, to Ambassador Benito Rizzo for this uh, opportunity to discuss such an important topic with such eminent panelists with me. Looking at the situation from Washington, I would uh, enumerate certain factors. Some of them have already been mentioned by Ambassador Benito Rizzo that are quite positive in a way. Uh, the rift among the GCC members that uh, basically is now overcome also thanks to the US leadership. 
the Iraqi elections that gave a severe blow to the pro-Iranian parties recently. As we have a new administration, a new prime minister in Israel, a new leadership that apparently is not willing to play the Iranian nuclear file inside the American politics between Democrats and Republicans. We have also US military assets moving to Jordan in order to find a better location and a, let's say a let's say more secure location far away from a certain country that we all know is it. And as to the country I was mentioning it, Iran, well, there are the possibility that this isolation is going to, to, to increase due to a new oakish president. Of course, this rosy picture has a big elephant in the room, which is obviously how we are going to assess the recent American withdrawal from Afghanistan. Is this simply the end of a long, painful, and hopeless conflict, or is the first step of a major U.S. disengagement from Western Asia to focus on the Indo-Pacific? Well, I would say that while it's evident that Washington is dedicating increasing attention to China and East Asia, as exemplified by the Quad, this new acronym that we have to take into account, and the recent and new acronym, AUKUS, deal with the submarine, I believe that uh, I don't believe that the Middle East will become secondary. I mean, from my very personal point of view, if the United States are going to maintain a presence in the Middle East, which is incidentally the major energy top supplier of China, is going to get a significant leverage or potential leverage on China. At the same time, we should not forget that the future of Biden administration is not hanging, with all due respect, on Arab or Middle Eastern policies, but on two major pieces of legislation stuck in the American Congress on infrastructure, welfare, and green economy, stuck, curiously, curiously by two Democratic senators. However, there's, in, there's also another face of the coin for Washington to consider, and it is not pleasant. On January 2020, Donald Trump could proudly claim the elimination of Iran's main strategist, Qasem Soleimani. The Abraham Accords had introduced the sense of a new beginning between Israel and some Arab states. And Iran, as we know, was isolated. Today, we have Joe Biden in the White House, in the Oval Office, with other priorities. I would say that without the crucial joining of Saudi Arabia, the Abraham Accords could lose some momentum. Meanwhile, UAE and Saudi Arabia are starting an apparently promising dialogue with uh, Iran. And Iran, this is the most important aspect, appears dangerously close to have enough rich uranium for a nuclear device while its proxies are maintaining or reinforcing their grip in Lebanon, Syria, and Yemen, to say the least. And as to Iraq, you know, uh, although the, the, the results, uh, my direct experience in such country tell me that the votes there are weighted and not only counted, and that the political arrangement after the vote are definitely more important than people's will. And we have to see how, to see how, and if and how this will play in the expected American withdrawal. I then believe that we should assume that the main driver of U.S. policy in the region will continue to be Iran, how effectively to curb its ambition, which corresponds also to a primary Israeli interest, and not only Israel. Uh, the objective uh, remains to resume nuclear talks in Vienna, and the this could take place soon, in November. But uh, this game changer of the Iran as a nuclear threshold state is something that is going to affect uh, the, the negotiation and giving an extreme leverage to its leadership. And uh, even if Iran go back to the talks, the talks will be difficult because there's mutual distrust uh, between uh, the parties. The only realistic option we have now is just to 
go to original JCPOA. But for many, this original JCPOA is not enough, especially for Israel. So they are talking about a, a plan B. In other words, a military attack uh, on the Iranian facility. Uh, we don't know at this stage if Israel has the capability, if there's going to be an American consent. And so from this point of view, also the Washington-Jerusalem dynamic is going to be very important. But while the outcome of a military strike will be, uh, will be is uncertain in a way, what is appears certain that it could not change the evolving strategic landscape. Before JCPOA was signed, Russia and China were concurring with the sanctions. Today, they are only the American one. And so I, I have the feeling that Moscow and Beijing are not ready to throw Iran under the bus. Iran has joined the Shanghai Cooperation Agreement, is uh, redirecting its trade in the region, in uh, Eurasia. And the conclusion seems that Iran is not uh, believing the sanction will have uh, an effect. So the maximum uh, pressure applied by, by the Americans is, not, is reacted by the maximum pressure of Iran. And uh, so just to conclude, never as in this moment, uh, it is necessary that uh, Washington, NATO, with all the challenges and uh, the strategic vision ahead, and other Western and regional capital, they have to read the tea leaves correctly. This is the only way to conceive sound and possible effective policies to reach stability in a highly volatile region. And a second requirement would be that all the actors refrain from the zero-sum games they have conducted for too much time only to detriment of the people in the region. Thank you very much. Thank you. Fantastic timing as well. Thank you, Marco, and lots of food for thought. Um, next up from the Kingdom of Jordan, we have um, Ambassador Ahmed Masadeh, whose uh, most notable role known to many of us here was as former Secretary General for the Union of the Mediterranean. He's currently a practicing lawyer and a partner in uh, private practice and has served also as ambassador to the EU, Belgium and Norway. Is that enough? I think. <laughs> anyway, over to you for your perspective from where you're sitting. Thank you very much. Pleasure. It's a pleasure to be here again uh, after two years of stoppage and uh, I would like to extend my thanks again to our dear friend Alessandro Minotto Rizzo for always uh, showing uh, uh, his uh, courteous uh, uh, and generous uh, behavior towards all of us and also hopefully leaving a legacy for the region, uh, uh, for this foundation and for whoever is interested in forging uh, economic and political good ties between uh, uh, the two uh, um, sides of the Mediterranean uh, Sea, if I may say. So thank you very much, Alessandro. Um, Indeed, I, I was asked to, asked to, to speak about um, uh, the difficult uh, international recomposition of the region and its persistent fragilities. Um, and um, in order not uh, uh, to uh, be repetitive, um, uh, I refer you to the booklet or the dossier of uh, uh, the NATO Foundation of some notes that I mentioned and they are encrypted there at page 81. And I believe, st and still believe that in order to uh, move forward with the fragilities, inherited fragilities of our region, uh, that we have to always uh, look at three cornerstone elements uh, in moving forward. And that is, first of all, that we have to have democracy as our ultimate objective. We also have to focus on human rights uh, uh, as being the core of uh, the social systems in the Middle East. And also we have always to think about jobs, industry, science, and innovation for our youth. Uh, I, I still uh, continue, I continue to, uh, to, to uh, believe that these are cornerstones that we have to focus on in order to uh, overcome the fragilities of the region. But I would like to add two more uh, uh, elements uh, uh, um, in light of what happened over the last two years. Mainly, I believe that we have to be more pragmatic and practical, and we have to engage more on reconciliation based on diplomacy. 
Um, in terms of pragmatism, um, I, I do believe that if we take the example of Syria, after 10 years of, uh, of conflict of, or civil war, um, now we are starting to talk again to the Syrian regime. I am not by any means uh, overlooking uh, whatever uh, values have been uh, um, violated over the past 10 years uh, in terms of practices by uh, the Syrian regime in that country. But I do believe that in order for us to move forward, Syria has to be brought back to the Arab League and uh, Syria has to be uh, involved again uh, in regional uh, geopolitics. And you may notice how now there is a focus on the gas uh, uh, pipeline that is stemming from Egypt going through Jordan to uh, Syria and obviously to Lebanon, that country which faces serious uh, electricity and energy problems. And probably, probably um, uh, you know, bringing back reconciliation uh, between uh, uh, these countries on, on the economic uh, uh, terms will lead to more uh, geopolitical uh, uh, and political reconciliation and inclusion. Um, if I also look at what uh, my dear colleague, the ambassador, uh, uh, mentioned uh, about Iraq. When we see that there are positive signs coming from a country, such as, for instance, the outcome of the elections in Iraq, and that there is um, a, 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 the, the Iranian uh, political power is receding in that country, I do believe that the regional powers and the international community should lend hand, should support the Iraqi government in augmenting such processes. And of course, this will lead to confronting the Iranian hegemony in the region. Obviously, it seems to me that the international community looks at our region uh, through the lens of the Iranian-Israeli conflict, which is, with all due respect, is a mistake. I, I do believe that the international community, especially the Americans, also should focus on the inherited problems that our countries have. I mean, the country, uh, the, the, the region is not just about the Iranian presence, whether it was in Lebanon or it was in Syria or in Yemen, but there are other problems uh, that, that we, we face in, uh, in, uh, in, in our region. For instance, also, if I may take you to Tunisia, and that is one of the other problems that also is receding. When we see that the political Islam is, is, uh, 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 is, is receiving um, 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 negative shocks from the communities, uh, not doing well in, in elections in Morocco, um, um, also uh, being fragmented uh, uh, in Tunisia. I, I do believe that we, we need to look at this from a social perspective and analyze it carefully. It seems to me that uh, uh, people and political structures in the region are coming to terms with, with the reality that we really need to separate religion from the structures of the state. Uh, that is something very important. And I do believe that uh, uh, President uh, uh, Qais Saeed uh, uh, efforts need to be supported. I'm not at all uh, uh, arguing for uh, overtaking democracy or human rights, but I do believe that uh, uh, we need to safeguard what Tunisia uh, has done so far. And I do believe that this is a model where we need to invest uh, more uh, uh, in, in, in that country. Now, um, I will I'll finish by, by saying that we, we keep talking about international recomposition. And I do believe that if we look at the efforts that uh, were exerted by the international community over the past uh, 20 or 30 years, it, it proved to be futile. Probably now we have to think about reconciliation and efforts from the region itself, from inside the region, from the grassroots. For instance, we noticed how the maximum pressure that was placed by President Trump on uh, the region, especially in terms of the peace process, uh, uh, did not uh, uh, you know, bring any uh, 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 positive effects. And probably now the U.S. has to go back to its best tool in the region, and that is diplomacy. The U.S. must engage again uh, with its diplomatic weight in order to find uh, more reconciliations in the reason, uh, region. But I do believe that such reconciliations must start 
uh, and end with regional power in, uh, uh, in, in our region. And thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, very good timing so far. Um, next, we have Professor Ambassador Mahmoud Karim um, from the Arab Republic of Egypt, where he's formerly been ambassador to the EU and NATO. Um, he also leads the Egypt and Middle East Center, SEMES, in Cairo. And most recently, you've been active, I believe, in an eminent persons group for nuclear disarmament, which was convened by the Foreign Minister of Japan. So you have a wide-ranging experience there. Over to you, please. Please take the floor. Thank you very much. I'll try to speak quickly because I have a lot of information to share in just seven minutes, but begin by thanking the Foundation and for the study work done by our good friend Alessandro Rizzo for all this effort that he's doing. Uh, I will speak on three subjects. The first will be a look from within our region, from the Arab world, and how do we see the world? and see matters now. One, I think the point has been made that little attention is given to the Arab world, the Palestinian problem in particular. Attention is focused more on China and COVID and climate change and so on. Second, we feel that our Arab world is a scene for wars by proxy and that the fate of our region is not in our hands. This has been uh, said clearly by the Secretary General of the League of Arab States, Mr. Abul Ghait, in a recent conference in Sharqa in September uh, uh, 26, when he said that the Arab world is still suffering a great deal from the ramifications of the Arab Spring, which destroyed the will and statehood of uh, many Arab countries, unquote. Three, there are lessons from Afghanistan, and they are very much reverberating in our part of the world. We are now, as Arab public opinion, questioning how can we rely on friends? And to make matters worse, Patriot silos are being withdrawn from the Gulf, and military cuts of 130 million in military assistance are being imposed on Egypt right in the middle of its war on terror. And of course, Arab uh, daily press uh, argues that imposing Western values in Afghanistan uh, fails. Number four, the fleeing of an Afghan president and the training of 300,000 Afghan army, and as we were said and told by the American president that I have confidence in this, in this army, and the army collapses in a matter of hours, uh, which cost millions of dollars and, and, and hours of training, is a failure of assessment of intelligence. And I think this is a very important point to make uh, in this regard. Five, as we look to Europe and its transatlantic relationship, we see signs of a rift. I personally cannot understand some of the key words that came out of the September 2nd EU defense ministers, and I will mention some of them. A credible joint rapid deployment force, a response force, strategic autonomy. Very interesting, but we need to understand who will fund all uh, these credible EU force and so on. And whether they will conflict with NATO or not. And what is our place in what was said in the EU ministers of defense uh, statements, which until today raises many questions that need to be answered. Five, we see the failure of political Islam, proven by the losses of the Muslim Brotherhood in the Sudan, Egypt, Morocco, Tunisia, resignations of more than 131 eminent leaders from the Nahda party in, in Tunisia, and uh, we want the world to understand that please give the Arab world a chance to decide for itself. We want the, Arab, the, the Western world to understand that imposing political Islam in one way or another, as we feel in our part of the world, will not uh, pay uh, tribute. And I think the famous Jessica Matthews, a famous uh, columnist in, in foreign affairs wrote about American power after Afghanistan, rightly said that democracy is not the default system of the whole world. I will not uh, quote her whole uh, article. Number two, what we Arabs question and fear. We ask, will the carrot and stick policy as pledges of economic assistance to Taliban succeed in making them change? Will the world look 
the other side about Afghan women right in exchange for further cooperation with Taliban. Nine, the rise of jihadist pilgrimage to Afghanistan, irrespective of the Doha agreement and meeting, undoubtedly created by the US withdrawal after ISIS, has given ISIS a wider space to operate. And we need a massive, and this is a, an important point that I want to underscore, coordinated intelligence network involving key Arab countries to monitor the situation, to share information with what is happening in Doha in, in these uh, talks. Please do not repeat the same mistakes that happened in Iran when all the talks were shrouded in secretly and GCC countries and major Arab countries were not in the picture and not knowing uh, what, what is happening. I don't have to remind or to speak on why I am saying this point, but I think that uh, stressing the point that uh, an intelligence network and strategic dialogue between uh, the West and key Arab countries is very important. The Arab world also fears the return of the nexus between drug trading, small arms and light weapons, and I fear weapons of mass destruction and linked to international terrorism. No one wants in our part of the world, Afghanistan, to become once more a safe haven incubating international terrorism or a base for exporting terrorism with uh, money gained from opium and so on. And finally, a point we often forget, which is the nexus between terrorism and refugee camps. Various countries can become a hatchery factory for raising new young terrorists. And if you tie this to illegal immigration to Europe, then you really have a very serious problem. Please look carefully at what is happening in refugee camps in different parts of, uh, especially with young boys and girls. And my third and last point, the options for the Arab world. Of course, we need to strengthen the role of the state. As said, a failed state is a safe haven for terrorism and fundamental jihadist group. We have many examples, Syria, Iraq, uh, Yemen, Libya, and so on. Libya alone has 30 unknown uh, militias and 1,600 factions. The role of the state, the central role of the state must be augmented. The Arab world may look to diversify, especially if we see today the prices of oil, diversify its options, especially in military hardware. Equally important is the fact that the Arab world should uphold issues like sustainable development, human rights, good governments, and so on. On the Abrahams Accord, I am for it. I support it. But I think there is a very big onus on Israel. Every time a brutal attack happens against Al-Aqsa Mosque or on Gaza, public opinion rises and many are said uh, uh, against that. Iranian drones, export of resolution, war by proxy, factionalism, and nuclear programs that are all challenges to our Arab world will of course transcend established norms. And I just want to give an example of the behavior of Iran. In a very recent conference in Iraq, when all the presidents were standing there, the foreign minister of Iran came from the very back and stood before or next to the presidents at the very beginning. This is the kind of how Iran sees itself in this, uh, in this moment. And Libya, of course, should be a matter of uh, focus and cooperation I see between Egypt and Italy. And finally, I think it is important that further cooperation between NATO and the United Nations, since both face global challenges in climate change and in many other countries, disrupting the technologies, women, peace and security is essential for the coming period. And I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, we're now moving from that, thank you very much for that wide sweeping panorama, a lot of issues to deal with, um, but also some constructive um, suggestions as to how to address it. We're now moving to our remote, so is he going to appear on screen? Our remote panelist, um, Ambassador Oded Iran, who is currently a senior research fellow at the Institute of, oh, there he is, Shalom. <laughs> Um, he's a senior research fellow at the Institute for National Security Studies in Tel Aviv, where he was previously director. Um, like the other panelists, he's been a former ambassador to the EU and NATO as well. 
Um, and whilst he was ambassador to Jordan, he was head of Israel's negotiating team for the Palestinians. So welcome, Oded. The floor is yours for the next uh, seven to ten minutes. Dr. Spencer, uh, for the introduction, uh, and, and thanks for the, to the president of the NDFC, I think, uh, or CF, uh, I think that this is a very important tradition that uh, you have established, uh, Ambassador Minuto Rizzo, in uh, conducting this uh, annual meeting, uh, discussing the Middle East uh, issues. And I, I find it very useful. And I am very happy to uh, share somewhat remotely uh, the podium with my colleagues from Jordan and from Egypt. Uh, I want to uh, somewhat continue the pessimistic uh, prognosis or, or description that uh, the commander of the college, the NATO college, has uh, uh, started with, and I, uh, I share the views and the uh, analysis. Uh, if I look uh, at the economic situation, it's enough if you read the recent World Bank uh, analysis of the region, of the MENA region, produced only at the beginning of this uh, month. And it's a very bleak one, although it is formulated in diplomatic uh, language, uh, but the, 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 the prognosis is for a very slow exit from the COVID-19 and its uh, implications. Maybe some countries will see a, a greater growth uh, then 2%, but uh, if I look at, uh, uh, for example, the neighboring countries, uh, a country to Israel, Jordan, hardly 2% in the next couple of years, and this is not very promising. If I look at the report, the analysis of unemployment, in the young generation, several countries, more than 25% in some countries, 40% unemployment in the young generation. Uh, in several Arab countries, and including also in Israel, 25% under the poverty line. Friends, this is a powder keg. Sooner or later, this is going to explode in our faces. And it's going, it's not, it doesn't look as it's going to improve uh, in the, as, in the for, foreseeing coming years. Uh, this is uh, issue number one, and a very important uh, one to look at. The second one is the climate revolution. Uh, it is a noble goal to move to uh, a renewable, sources of energy instead of the fossil uh, resources that we are using now. I'm not facetious. I think that this is a very noble and very important to our future existence on this planet. However, there are various dangers that I don't know how you mitigate or how you deal with. The, uh, the window is very short. We're talking about moving to uh, the green deal or the green uh, environment within 20 years or even less. Think about the oil producing countries uh, in the region. I'm not so sure that they can cope with the expected revolution. Some of them, yes, have invested in renewable sources, and they do a very good job in it. Uh, but I'm not so sure that they can keep the flow of income from renewables that they enjoy today. Even if you don't look at the prices of today, and look at the prices that uh, prevailed three months ago, even that level, I'm not so sure that they can 
maintain it with the Green Revolution. Secondly, my colleagues from Egypt and from Jordan know very well that their remittances from workers in the Gulf, in the oil producing countries, are a very important national, a familiar uh, income source. And so for the green production of energy, I'm not so sure that you need the same number for extraction of the oil that are needed today for the, for the drilling, extraction of the oil, refining the oil, transporting the oil in tankers, etc. they will not be needed. Or most of them will not be needed. So this is some sort of uh, adverse effects to uh, the green revolution. And think about other things. For example, the, uh, my colleague from, uh, from uh, uh, Jordan mentioned the, the pipeline, which is going to take uh, gas from Egypt through Jordan through Syria to Lebanon. Who is, number one, who is going to pay for that? Number two, this is a project which is, is so costly and it's only, if we take seriously, a green revolution that needs to be kicking in at, in, 40, in 2040. This is a very costly uh, uh, project for a very short period, relatively speaking. And I'm not so sure that the, in, the income will cover the investment. And so we are dealing with some issues that have a regional impact, which are not necessarily compatible with the uh, idea, the principle in the Paris agreements of moving to a green revolution in, uh, in uh, the very near future. The third one, the third element that was already mentioned, and this is what I call the absentee superpower in the, in the region. We, I think that we all agree that the United States has made a decision to uh, move away or to reduce its presence. I'm not so sure that we can see now someone else in terms of powers, external powers, stepping in this vacuum. I'm not so sure that Europe has the will, has the financial resources, or has the decision power to, to step in, at least economically, into the region. And there is a lot of talk and I think that most of it is unfounded on China stepping in. I don't see it. China is looking at this region or sub-region as a very interesting uh, proposition, politically speaking. Certain countries are very important to, uh, to China and the Belt and Road strategy, Iran, yes. Uh, I don't see the investments coming into Lebanon, coming into Syria, coming into Jordan, coming into Egypt. I don't see that. Not in, not in numbers that can create a change. So basically, the region is left to itself for the time being, which brings me to my concluding remarks. And that is, the region as a power, not totally to replace the vacuum created. I don't, I'm not that naive, but regional cooperation in terms of uh, increasing the water availability for the Palestinians, for the Jordanians, 
for the Egyptians is there. For the time being, we have the gas, uh, certain Egypt, certain Israel, Lebanon, if it could conduct its own business and own government in a semi-proper way, it could have produced the gas 10 years ago, as, as we did as the Egyptians. And so the, in the window of 20 years, we could somehow improve the situation as far as the water, as far as energy cooperation, as far as even cooperation on environment, these are regional issues. They are not particular to any state in the region. And so from that point of view, the Abraham Accords, Accords are a positive development. They don't come, certainly not in my view, at the expense of solving the, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Uh, there is a new government in Israel. Um, I think that once we approve the national budget, which is the immediate political target of the Israeli government, in two months, I think this will happen, maybe we will see a more constructive policies on the Palestinian issue. But I admit, don't expect this political issue to be solved in a comprehensive way. The two governments, the one in, Tel in, in Jerusalem and the one in Ramallah are incapable, politically speaking, to reach a comprehensive solution. What they can do and should do is build the road towards the two-state solution through, and I don't want to, to use the, the term CBMs, uh, uh, confidence building measures, but certain uh, projects, certain solutions uh, that are part of the two-state uh, comprehensive solution, and I will stop you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, we have just under half an hour for question and answer and discussion. So I would invite the audience here and also those watching online to prepare questions while I plant one for our panel to think about in the meantime. And then I believe there are microphones. I can see one here. And is there one further back where you'll be invited to stand up and, and actually ask the question from the microphone and obviously submit your questions online if you're watching via Zoom. Now, listening to all this, I'm wondering what, what is going to drive change in a positive way? Because at the moment, we've heard a lot about negative developments. Some are looking more positive. But if there's an absentee superpower, as we've heard, there isn't a leadership coming from outside. What possibility is there that a different kind of coalition, say from within the Arab world or from elsewhere, but particularly from within the Arab world, can actually find the incentives to act together for perhaps what may be a very narrow um, number of issues, but which hit all of them. For example, the economics, the fallout from the pandemic, um, where regional cooperation is definitely needed to see the way forward on water, we already heard, um, but on some of the more pressing issues, which every state and every society in the, in the region is going to be suffering, as indeed is, is Europe, which has become very internal looking, and the US from the fallout of the pandemic. So can I invite any of you individually to come up with what you might see as some way forward out of this, where the region itself, in some sense, takes responsibility for some of these challenges. I'm looking at my two Jordanian and Egyptian colleagues first, but Marco? Um, thank you. Uh, well, ag again, I, I do believe that um, uh, pragmatism and reconciliation yeah. uh, are the two uh, uh, methods that we need to 
uh, implement uh, in the coming three to five years in the region. Obviously, uh, it seems to me that um, with the COVID pandemic uh, receding, uh, exposure of the economic fragilities of the societies um, will, will show its face. Yeah. Uh, and I think that it's going to differ from one country to other country, depending on the economic situation uh, of, of each country. And this is why I believe that the governments in the regions um, have, should come to terms with, with, with uh, agreeing some sort of regional cooperation. And this is why I did mention the gas pipeline between Egypt, uh, Jordan, Syria, and Lebanon. And I see the point of uh, uh, my, de uh, my dear friend, Odid Iran, uh, um, you know, going more green. But at the end of the day, we have to find common projects in order to come together. Um, um, this is first. Secondly, I, I, I do believe that we have to be very practical and pragmatic. Uh, um, we, we just cannot keep looking in a very pessimistic uh, way at, at things. Uh, we have been hit hard in the last 10 years by what, what happened with, with the so-called the Arab Spring. And uh, uh, people lost their, their jobs, uh, uh, communities have been uh, destroyed destroyed uh, the, the social fabrics is, is different in in uh, in the region probably also there is a lot of friction socially i call it vertical and horizontal but we cannot continue to to be pessimistic so when i see a, a, a light if i may say at the end of the tunnel a hope uh, of, of regional cooperation i do believe that we have to do this and i believe that maybe we have to do it in blocks for instance, the Levant region. Now, let's focus on our things. Egypt, Syria, Jordan, Iraq. Let's focus on, on, on what we can, we, we can do together. Obviously, the Maghreb is, is, is another uh, uh, whole dynamic. Um, uh, last, uh, th this is a bit tricky. Uh, we need to analyze and focus uh, uh, the values that we need to implement in our societies. Uh, I, I keep uh, reiterating that uh, the, the human rights uh, uh, protection and the democratic values are very important. And I do believe that the EU, NATO, and the international community, when dealing with the region, should always uh, put forward uh, to the Arab world uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the safeguarding of these values in order for us to, to, to move forward. Uh, it, it, it will not work uh, 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 that we continue to do business uh, uh, as, as we used to do it in, in the past. We have to move forward in terms of political institutionalization, in terms of democracy, in terms of uh, giving the rule of, uh, rule of law its power in, in, in our societies. Um, and, and, and whenever I see for, for instance, uh, some, some hope, uh, like for instance in Iraq, I believe that we need to support what is happening there. Syria, again, I, I believe that the international community should uh, uh, um, accept the, the Syrian uh, uh, situation again. I know Jordan is playing a role in trying to bring back the Syrian uh, uh, government uh, on on, uh, on, uh, on the regional and international uh, level. And I believe that Syria is a very important country. It has also to be taken into consideration. Uh, probably most likely also the Gulf uh, reconciliation is very important. That, that region also should uh, should be supported in its efforts. And, and, the, and then my final message, I do believe that more fragmentation will lead us no more. What we need to do is more regional, internal reconciliation and coming together. Mahmoud, you talked about a failure of intelligence. Is yeah. People in the region know what's going on. You mentioned an important point, you know, mm -hmm. what will drive a change in our uh, mm -hmm. part of the world. And I, I, I think, and I keep repeating this point, that there is a permanent problem that remains unsolved and is being solved to the young boys and girls in the Arab world, youth, that Palestine and Israeli occupation of, of Palestine and the need to go ahead and solve this problem once and forever. I believe that once this is done, a very positive climate mm. will fall on, on, on our region 
and particularly on the youth that we all fear because the majority of population in, in the Arab world, in Egypt, in, in, in many other parts, are below 30 years old. Mm -hmm. And they are all living the trauma of the unresolved uh, Israeli-Palestinian problem. Mm -hmm. Second, you have a regional organization in the, in the Arab world, which is the League of Arab States. Yeah. That is a very important organization. It is doing good work. And I think the conditions now are much better than before, after... Uh, the solution of the problem with, with Qatar and so on. So there is a great deal of experience. We have a representative here, a dear friend of mine of the Arab League, and there is a great deal of expectation that because the political situation now is much better than before, that we can move ahead. And you have to tackle new ideas. Uh, I mean, someone said uh, green energy and, 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 and so on, a sustainable uh, development for the Arab uh, world. Uh, so on. So the, the organization, the league itself is capable and, and it needs to be augmented and supported in this regard. From the West, I still dream of a Marshall Plan. <laughs> because you have a, a, a region that has been destroyed. Many countries are still uh, in, in a state of a mess. And you need financial assistance to rebuild. And, and of course, uh, once you have economic assistance to this part of the world, then you will have better security. Mm. Human rights is, is essential. I agree with uh, Ambassador Masada. Uh, good governance and, and, and the, the need to respect the fundamentals of human rights in our part of the world. This was the main reason for 2011. Mm. Uh, but there are good changes that are happening now. Uh, particularly in the field of economic and, and social uh, rights. Uh, and, and, and we are not noticing them. We are focusing more on political rights and not really noticing what is happening, particularly in my country, which if you look at the, what is happening in this field, it, it, it borders on a miracle in a few years mm -hmm. in the field of economic and social rights. The, the problem we have with the West on this, uh, on this part should be sidestep, which is human rights and conditionality. Unless, then we will not. This is, this is the point that has to be sidestepped and put aside uh, for us to progress. If you want to promote human rights in our part of the world, then you need to cooperate. Not to put a priori conditions and say that unless you do that, we will not do this. So conditionality in this regard uh, is not going to happen. And my final point, a better understanding of political Islam. Please. There is a great deal of misunderstanding of uh, the fact that political Islam is equivalent to peaceful opposition. This is not the case. And there are many calls on Arab countries uh, to, uh, to accept and to give freedom of space and political space for uh, these groups such as the Muslim Brotherhood and so on. But I also say that if you want us to change, they too, the dogma, the ideology of these organizations has to change. You cannot continue to work in complete secrecy. If you ask any of these groups, what is the name of your representative in Alexandria, for example, this is a no-no. If you ask any of them, what is the means of your funding, and where it comes from, this is a no-no. These are not uh, democracy. I use democracy for election, and then I stay there and say no, no, no alternation of power. But election is democracy, and alternation of power is also fun a fundamental of democracy. So as much as we have to change, also these groups have to change to better uh, become integrated into our society. OK, thank you. Ambassador Rand, yes, you come in again uh -huh. now. To my colleague uh, uh, from Egypt, Ambassador Karem, if I believe personally that the solution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict will add 0.1% of employment or will reduce the poverty in the Middle East by 0.1%, I would personally lie on the pavement before the Prime Minister's office and stop the traffic. Uh, and believe me, 
I work very hard daily, uh, including meetings with the Palestinians uh, yesterday to try and solve, uh, at least start to solve the conflict. However, concrete ideas, cooperation in tourism. This is a major source of income for Egypt, for Jordan, for Palestine, for Israel. If we cooperated in the, this industry, which is beginning, just beginning to come out of the impact of the corona, I think that we will do much to help our economies. Certainly, uh, uh, in this core, uh, among the core countries of the region. Number two, cooperation in energy. We have started within the uh, Middle East, Middle East gas forum to cooperate. Jordan, Egypt, Israel, the Palestinians, uh, they cooperate together with some European countries interested in this uh, cooperation. And I think that in the future, once again, if and when the Lebanese come to their senses, we could certainly uh, uh, include them. I think that this is a very useful and a very interesting co cooperation among the region, uh, uh, regional uh, participants, and it can certainly assist uh, the economies of the relevant countries. Uh, communication. I think that uh, grids uh, can be connected, certainly from the east, uh, starting with Iraq, going through Jordan, going through Syria, going through Palestinian, Israelis. I'm speaking about conventional uh, uh, communication. Then when we come to the age of uh, a G5, G6, G7, they are around the corner. We, for example, in Israel, we are lacking uh, thousands of engineers in this area. We could certainly, and we are beginning to talk to Jordan about employing, because you can be an engineer sitting in Amman and working for a, a company uh, either in Palestine, either in Israel, and this could uh, certainly solve some unemployment uh, issues uh, in this country. I think that water is another one. We know that certain countries in the region are based, still based on agriculture, production and export. And this is a fact which we have to take into consideration, but what is missing is the water. And certainly we can cooperate there, desalinating water, uh, today with natural gas, tomorrow with green solar energy, which Jordan, for example, can produce certainly more cheaply than Israel can produce. And so the, the regional cooperation becomes not a full solution to the absent superpowers, but it becomes a very important part of the solution. Thank you very much. So Marco on the subject, well, and I'm uh, looking for hands around the room. Well, uh, economic cooperation is uh, definitely crucial. Uh, as And there are plenty of opportunity coming, especially as mentioned by Ambassador Iran on the renewable energy, that this definitely is going to be a driver. But this is, it's also needed a change of mentality in the sense, if you consider the Arab countries, they still have visa among each other, between each other. Their amount of respective trade is still very, very low, quite, quite low compared to the potential they could have. So basically, we have not found yet a way to, to, to integrate better the region among themselves. Now, uh, it was mentioned that there's going to be an absentee power. OK, fine. This is the occasion for other institutions to show how valid they are. There could be an opportunity, of course, a NATO for security. Uh, no discussion on that. But also the European Union in order to have a more active role in the region. Uh, I have some reservation on a Marshall Plan, not because it's not a good idea. It's definitely a good idea, but uh, 
If I go around the leaders in Europe in this moment, I see something, one word in their mind. Recovery plan, recovery plan, recovery plan. They are still thinking how to get out of the COVID and how to have uh, a new economy back in track. Because the, no matter what they say, there are still dark clouds ahead. And the other issue we should be focused is just to avoid that uh, incoming collapses take place. You mentioned Syria. There's Lebanon. In Lebanon, there are 2 million Syria refugees, roughly. Now, technically speaking, Lebanon is already collapsed. Okay, But if the situation go, goes beyond imagination, do you really believe that these 2 million Syrians will go back to Syria? No way. They will come to Europe, adding a further huge problem to European Union as such, because we know how much the refugee crisis, the migrants, uh, created a big blow to the concept of European Union six years ago, seven years ago. And the last comment, so if there's something to be done, it has to be done now on Lebanon. And as mentioned before, it should be done also in Syria. Come on, the war in Syria is lost. The bad guy won. Let's move on. <laughs> Sometimes we have to accept reality in this world. Because, uh, uh, and so now continuing sanctions against Syria. Yes, OK, it's keeping the dictator in place. But it's also affecting so dramatically millions and millions of people because international aid is highly constrained in reaching uh, Syria. Last word on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Uh, I've been dealing with this issue as special envoy in the past. It's all true, but what is missing in this picture? Everybody's talking about economic cooperation, economic cooperation, because of the political issue cannot be reached or cannot be solved. But don't forget that if the Israeli-Palestinian issue was an economic issue, and it is not, the Palestinian could have been bought out decades ago. The money spent on the dossier could make every single Palestinian family some millionaires. But the point is that many Palestinians, I don't want to say all the Palestinians, but many Palestinians, they still are attached to something that is called dignity. And they do not accept to trade money for their rights. And this is something that in the West we should make a bigger effort to understand. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right. Now, I've seen two hands already. So, gentlemen in the third row, and then behind you. So, if you'd like to go first. Sorry, I'm looking at you. The ambassador. Yes, Ambassador Barre, please. Sorry. Sorry, there's a pecking order. Anybody over this side? I haven't seen. Do stand up and wave, otherwise I won't see you. Please go ahead. Is it working? Can we hear? Not working. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Can we get some technical assistance, please? <laughs> Something's working. Okay. Repeating every now and then. Yes, no, um, right. First, I would like to thank you and the panelists for the good uh, explanation that you gave and the insight that you gave us. However, I would like to uh, uh, mention something that you uh, you have mentioned but uh, not uh, precisely. We feel in the Gulf countries that uh, 
Iran is playing a very bad role in uh, in the Middle East. Uh, for me, there is no difference between um, the system that we have uh, in Iran or Daesh or Islamic Brotherhood. They're all the same because they use a religion to, uh, for their political ends. And unfortunately, sometimes in Europe, we are cooperating with some of them and uh, uh, without understanding the reality of the things. I think we Muslims understand this more than anybody else. And I wish uh, the Europeans will understand and put themselves in our shoes. Now the opportunistic uh, uh, policies that Iran has undertaken since their arrival in, into governance, they have created proxies that has become armies today. I mean, who could compete today with Hezbollah or with Hamas today and Jihad, who are Iranian uh, proxies, or Houthis, who are on daily basis, they are sending rockets to Saudi Arabia. Or who can compete with the militia in Iraq that has been endorsed by the government itself to be part of it? And they are uh, 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 creating problems to them and uh, sending rockets to the uh, uh, coalition that are there to maintain peace. And um, who can tomorrow will be... Uh, 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 ca can go against uh, the Husseiniyun that is created in Azerbaijan? Who can go against the Fatimiyun who was becoming more and more powerful in Afghanistan? All those, Iran is doing it. They are financing, they are financing all these proxies. And recently it has been declared. They have declared very vividly in front of everyone uh, the Revolutionary Guard. They said, we have six armies, they are mistaken, they have seven or eight. Uh, and they are uh, using these armies in order to uh, uh, follow the uh, policies of Iran or uh, they have also army in Syria today. So the, the question is, Iran should not be only talked about on, uh, on its... Uh, nuclear uh, issues, but also in its intervention in other countries. Yeah. That means Europe, America, and the region, people of the region should sit on the table against Iran and tell her, here we are, don't interfere, do this, do that. At least think of your people, who 40% of them, according to the statics, under the line of poverty. This is uh, Iran. And in Europe, we are not doing anything. We think of Iran only as a place of commercial opportunity. So if, if Europe, America wants stability and good uh, economic progress and good investment and good income also, is through uh, a real work that will start with Iran first, I think. Thank you very much Thank for you. making that point. Thank you. Um, the next gentleman, you've been patiently waiting. Please, I'll take several questions and then you can respond. Yes, my name is uh, Carlo Trezza. I'm a member of uh, the scientific committee of NATO Defence College uh, Foundation. And okay. Curiously, my question is also on, <laughs> on Iran but uh, seen from another angle, probably mainly on the JCPOA, which uh, was uh, mentioned in particular by Ambassador Carnelos. Speaking of a uh, vacuum, which is being um, determined in the area, there is a vacuum in the management of the JCPOA. And there, I'm afraid the, the European Union has uh, a responsibility since <laughs> We are, the EU is, is actually chairing uh, uh, the joint committee, uh, the, the joint plan. And therefore, the question is, um, I mean, what uh, the speakers, uh, including the one in, in, in Israel, uh, think about the future? Uh, 
Um, Ambassador uh, Carmelos mentioned the fact that uh, the new uh, prime minister in Israel is less, shall we say, aggressive than his uh, predecessor, which this would be good news. But on the other hand, we have the, I, I have the sense that uh, uh, President Biden is not really very much engaged in his, uh, let's say, electoral promise of uh, returning to the JCPOA. The sanctions uh, of the US are still uh, in force uh, right now. So I'm mm. somehow uh, put, putting the question to the speakers, uh, what they see is the future of, of this arrangement. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, since they're both complementary, as the Russians would say, what is to be done about Iran? I'm looking at you, Marco, because the JCPOA is of deep concern to the US? First of all, let's see the issue in perspective. When the JCPOA negotiations started more than 10 years ago, the position was, even before started, no enrichment for Iran. They say, basically, even before Iran has to come to the negotiation, he has to stop enrichment. That was a Bush administration condition. Okay. Uh, when the negotiation started, we all made a mistake in assessing why Iran went into the negotiation. We presumed that it was due to the sanction. Yes, sanction was a factor, definitely. But there was another factor that, uh, in a way, paved the way for the talks, and that Obama administration wisely, in my own opinion, drop the Bush administration precondition. Because it was illogic. If we have to negotiate on the enrichment, the Iranian point of view was, why I have to give up the enrichment even before the negotiation starts, if the core of the negotiation is my program, and therefore the enrichment. And so the negotiation started and arrived at the, an outcome that was not the ideal outcome. We all know that. But by definition, a negotiation implies a compromise. Otherwise, it's not a negotiation. It's a dictat. And for a dictat, you use other tools. Now we are in the paradoxical situation that after 10 years, we have Iran that is close to the nuclear threshold to have enough uh, enrichment for making a nuclear device. By the way, there's two different. One point is to have enough uh, uranium. Another point is to have a bomb ready to be used. There are two different issues. A bomb ready to be used needs reasonably and a deliverable bomb two years after you have enough uranium. And you can only have one bomb because it's now we are in a situation which Iran. So if we have to go in retrospect, this is a complete blunder and was completely self-inflicted. I, 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 pain, it's painful to say by us, but the simple fact that, that the JCPOA was not perfect, but was thrown away by Donald Trump. And now we have in a very ironic situation that the Iranians are so, let's say, arrogant to go to the American and to say, hey, I will come back to the negotiation table, but as a goodwill gesture, you should uh, uh, release $10 billion fund because as a goodwill gesture. So at the, 10 years ago, the Iran was asked to have, make a goodwill gesture suspending the enrichment, and now it's the Iran that is asking the United States the goodwill gesture. Because there's a fundamental problem. Even the Americans, they know that. The trade is the Iran goes back to the deal, the Americans lift the sanctions. Well, soon we will discover that there are some technical and legal problems that could prevent the American to release the sanctions due to the Congress and due to the many other things. So at this point, we are in a situation that even for the Iranians, going back to the JCPOA is not so necessary 
because as I said before, they believe the sanctions. They can weather the sanctions because now they have the deal with China, they have the deal with Russia, and so and so. So we need the cooperation of Russia and China on Iran. But how can we pretend to have the cooperation of China and Russia on Iran if one day and another we are quarreling with Russia and China? So, I mean, we have to decide what we want. We cannot get Iran constrained, China constrained, and Russia constrained. Yes, ideally, it would be the best of the world, but we have not the resources. Not only an economic, let me add, we have not even the intellectual resources to carry out such a smart policy. Thank you. I, I have a yes, thumbs up. It's, it's not only Russia and China, it's the GCC countries also. And, and there are many countries in the region who are at stake from what, from what is happening. I second what the ambassador of Bahrain said, and I, I, I thank him very much for saying. And may I add, sir, that uh, since the, 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 the stopping of the JCPOA and so on, uh, you have new elements of danger for our region. No one spoke of Iranian missiles capability. No one spoke of Iranians' capability in drones, advanced drones, that are being sent every day to hit uh, civilian targets in uh, Saudi Arabia and, and, and elsewhere. No one is saying anything about the export of uh, revolution and hegemony and the same old uh, structure. And if we were before speaking of stopping Iran from acquiring a nuclear weapon, we are now in the situation where Iran is a nuclear threshold country. How will this affect the situation in the Middle East? Will there be a nexus between this situation and Taliban in Afghanistan, I wonder? These are all questions that I put before the audience. Please. I, I, I would like just to also to add to all of this that um, when we discuss the Iranian issue, we, we have one of two options to deal with it, either confrontation or inclusion. And I think if we want to be pragmatic, we saw that the maximum pressure policy of the administration of Trump failed and got us to where Ambassador Marcos rightfully said with this blunder that we have now, in terms of, uh, of, of Iran. So I believe that whether it was the international community or also regional countries, we need to engage on a dialogue with Iran. We have to include, we have to be inclusive. I, I, I do not support the intervention in other countries. I fully, I fully understand exactly what my dear colleagues, the ambassadors have just said. And we in Jordan, are very, very cautious about, about, about the Iranian interventions. But what do we do then? I mean, we all, either we go into confrontation, and that is not an option, obviously, or we have to be inclusive. And to be inclusive, we have to engage with the Iranians. We have to speak to them. Let's try that out. Ambassador Iran, would you like to react to the idea of dialogue with the Iranians? We've got less than a minute left, so we'd be delighted if you were concise. Sorry, we can't hear you. Are you speaking? Have you got your volume on? Mike is mute. The mic. <laughs> I'm sorry, we, are you speaking now? We can't hear you because the mic is muted. No, it's, the, oh. my, my mic is okay. Ah, oh, well, now we can hear you. So quickly, okay. 30 seconds. Quickly, I afraid. will not use more than 10 seconds. <laughs> right, 10 seconds. The ambassadors seconds. <laughs> uh, from Bahrain and from Egypt did a very good job in explaining the situation, and I accept every word they said. Great. <laughs> I think we've got the message. Thank you very much, Ambassador. You're so dialogue it is with Iran. You want to resolve something, you have to speak, which is what we're doing now. So thank you very much indeed for this session.
Before we close, I'm going to pass over straight away to uh, my Sam Azam session where she'll be conducting an interview on the energy dilemma. So we've touched on the energy future in the region. We're going to hear much more about traditional sources versus renewables. But before we all leave the stage and invite them to come up here, thank you very much. Will you join me in thanking the panel and uh, Oded uh, away in Tel Aviv very much for their contributions? Thank you. And I've been reminded to tell you, if you're impatient, a coffee break will follow you after the uh, interview that's going to take half an hour now. So hold on for that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Test one, two. If we start now, we'll start seven minutes later than what was supposed to be. Uh, however, let's start now. Um, Claire, thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you for the uh, amazing session. Um, it covered almost everything. <laughs> However, uh, I'd like also to thank you for joining us in this uh, uh, discussion. It's not called a session, but a discussion. And basically, it's entitled Energy Dilemma and um, basically traditional sources versus renewable. Most of the recent reports I went through conclude that Energy transition is technically feasible and economically beneficial, and the socioeconomic footprint is obvious. And that made me think, if this is the case, why are we still with a, an energy dilemma? What is hindering us from uh, moving forward along the sustainable pathway at a quicker pace? And these are the questions that uh, we will try to answer with our distinguished uh, guests here. Allow me to introduce my guests, uh, Jamal Fakhro, Managing Partner, KPMG Manama, welcome. And Mr. Marco Pereda, Head of Political Scenarios and Institutional Support for Business Development in Iran, welcome. And uh, I'll start with an introductory uh, question, basically regarding the title of this discussion. Um, what do you understand by the expression energy dilemma? And I will add here also the end of the sentence, which is traditional uh, uh, sources versus renewables, because you had your own 
view about it. How do you interpret that? Thank you, and thanks to the NATO uh, College for for inviting us. Um, well, first of all, let me say that uh, I would uh, use the, the word trilemma instead of dilemma, and uh, let me explain this uh, afterwards. But let me first focus on this, uh, uh, let's say, alternative between the conventional sources and the renewables. Well, uh, I don't see a real versus, one, one versus the other, because even today, uh, in the very real time we are living, we understand that we will uh, need and use for the next decades uh, also conventional resources, which will be key for, for development, for, for uh, uh, reducing energy poverty, for living, for our lives. And on the other hand, we will be struggling for reducing the carbon footprint of these conventional resources. And at the same time, uh, a process that has already started, at the same time, improving, increasing uh, the, the use of uh, uh, renewables. Re renewables are not the only answer for the transition. Uh, of course, uh, it's the easiest way of uh, talking about transition, and uh, uh, this is uh, normal in a, in a media world. But then, uh, when we talk about carbon neutrality, for example, which is uh, uh, one of the key words of this debate, well, carbon neutrality doesn't mean that uh, by 2050 or 2060 we will, know, we will have no emissions we will have some remaining amounts of emissions, which are not, uh, let's say, if for t as of today, are not uh, uh, possible to be uh, uh, put to zero. But uh, we will be carbon neutral because together with this uh, remaining amount of emissions, we will have uh, some negative emissions. That's to say some contribution to take out of the environment, the carbon that we have emitted. Uh, sorry, For example, just, this is CCUS, this is forestry. Just a clarification. When you say we, you mean the whole world, the Arab region, Middle East, or what? Does it apply everywhere or not? Very good point. Uh, the, the short answer is the whole world, mm -hmm. but with different uh, contributions. And the, the Arab world, the MENA region, have very good assets to put in place in this, uh, in this struggle, in this effort. Let me just explain the trilemma mm -hmm. and then uh, uh, stop with, with my, my answer. Trilemma is a, a, a key word. Uh, we, we can thank the World Economic in the council for, 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 for this, it is trying to combine the sustainability in the environmental uh, dimension, the sustainability in terms of uh, social dimension, the fact that you have enough energy to, to live and to work and to produce, and then the security of supply. This mm -hmm. is the trilemma that we, uh, I would uh, better uh, use to describe the very difficult situation we are in. That's really interesting, and I would like uh, to uh, see um, um, the interpretation of Mr. Jamal Fakhru before we uh, dig deep in what you just said. Mr. Jamal Fakhru, uh, Fakhru do you thank agree? You, and, yes. Well, thank you, Mr. Rahm. Thanks for the invitation. For, for the invitation. I think, I think uh, the, the, the dilemma is there in the Arab world, simply because we are producers of oil. The, the issue is, the issue is, it might not be a dilemma for the users, for the consumers, but it is definitely an, an issue for the producers because we are living out of that. So the minute we reduce the quantity of our production of oil that we are selling today to the, to the, to the international market, that will have a big impact on the revenue of those governments who are living. Today, most of the Arab countries funding and financing comes from selling of oil and gas. Countries like Saudi, Kuwait, UAE, Iraq, Libya, it goes up to 75-85% of the government budget comes from that. So it will definitely have an impact on the oil producing countries, negative, but it will have a positive impact on the non-oil producing countries where they will go really to meet the agenda of the world. So I think we have to look, we, have, we cannot have a one single answer, 
it will be uh, an answer depend on each country. Okay, that's interesting. But uh, still, we have one common thing amongst all of us, which is the pandemic. How hard was it in all the, uh, on all the countries? Well, the pandemic definitely had a, a, a huge impact, and I think it didn't hit only the Arab world, it hit the whole world. We in the Arab world definitely have been hit a lot, uh, simply because of the, of the readiness of our uh, health system, the readiness of our companies and our governments for such a pandemic. We were not prepared, nobody was expecting anything, and it had definitely a big impact on our ability to invest or to, to respend in our markets. Uh, uh, when it comes to, 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 to energy and to the re renewable energy, it was a fantastic headline in the past 10 years. But as Marco said, we did very little on that. But we have got the a... The pace was slow? It was, the pace was slow. We didn't take it... I don't believe the Arab country took that subject seriously. I don't believe that... that Do you agree, consider. Mr. Marco? I, I, I would uh, make some differences, but uh, overall I would agree. There are differences between those uh, Arab countries, uh, a minority that uh, have been able to start a, a real differentiation in the economy and also starting a real uh, effort in energy transition, uh, also because they have some assets others don't. Uh, but then, uh, as uh, it was mentioned uh, uh, before, there are, the majority are still too much dependent on oil and gas. And dependency on oil and gas makes uh, by itself a difference because those countries, uh, such as uh, Saudi Arabia, Arabia uh, Iraq, Kuwait, uh, uh, that are dependent more on oil, uh, are let's say have additional problems uh, since uh, gas is a still a, a considered a bridge fuel or some some um, a, a solution for at least domestic uh, energy use with different uh, much lower emissions so they have some advantage if we compare so we, we should, in my view we sh we shall classify in oil dependent dependent gas dependent and uh, the most differentiated economies already is, is, is starting the path for uh, for renewables, for other solutions. Uh, and where are, can you pinpoint on the areas where they started or concentrated more uh, in the region? You, may, you mean for, for transition? For the, yes. uh, I see a very good, let's say, uh, uh, path by the Emirates in general, uh, for many reasons, probably there is a, 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 an intangible asset which is a key, which is governance, good governance of energy. Uh, uh, we can see from uh, uh, Qatar to the, the United Arab Emirates to Oman also trying to build uh, important uh, rene renewable projects or uh, build important alliances with other uh, countries and areas. Or also, uh, without talking always about renewables, uh, trying to reduce the footprint of uh, gas, for example because it makes a, a huge difference if you sell a LNG cargo by a, 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 in a, on a conventional uh, way or you sell an, energy, uh, an LNG cargo which is carbon neutral. That is to say, a cargo that uh, brings w with it the titles uh, of uh, uh, certain uh, of its in, uh, environmental impact uh, offset by certain environmental uh, activities, for example, forestry, etc. This is something that uh, we will uh, hear about more and more in the next uh, few days and in, 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 in months uh, about reducing the impact of conventional resources, mm -hmm. not just cancelling them. Uh, but in a slow pace, according to what you said, as far as I understand, Mr. Fakhro, who's responsible and uh, who to blame? Is it uh, the government? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, I mean, see, who will take who will take the the leadership in any country? It's the it is the executives. It is the governments. And as I said, seriously, I didn't see clear 
item of the agendas of most of the government in the Arab world to talk about reducing the the the, the carbon uh, the, 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 the 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 impact of the carbon. We didn't we have see Saudi Arabia and all the initiative, the green uh, initiative. Yes, yeah, Saudi Arabia and UAE, they are one or two countries have taken this seriously. Maybe maybe Oman have that, but really not on a big scale. Number one. Number two, we are starting from almost a zero level. We are not like European countries who have been doing this for the last decades. I mean, Germany, I think, if I'm not mistaken, today they produce about 25-30% of your energy from renewables. We in our country, you tell me which country in the Arab world produce 5% of their energy requirements from, from renewables. None. Most of the countries, about my, my country, Bahrain, our, our, our plan is to have 5% by 2025. Mm -hmm. would, we, would we meet it? I have my doubt about that. Why? Simply because we don't focus on it. We still depend. We still depend on the, on the, on the, on the, on the uh, normal energy. We still believe that we have got time to do that. We are not. We we don't have enough deep money to invest in this in this uh, in, the, in the renewables because this requires lots of money. Mm -hmm. Most of the countries in the region, although they are cash rich, they have huge deficit in their in their in their, in their budget. Mm -hmm. So they can't really again go and meet that where they have so many requirements and the social requirements in their communities. Okay. We would need some time to see the impact of those of, of those policies. Saudi started, UAE start, started, others started. See, so today, today you will see countries, uh, because of the need, because, I mean, Lebanon as an example, mm -hmm. because of the shortage of energy, people started to go to, to invest, individuals, not government, mm -hmm. individuals to go to invest in the renewables. Okay? But... How, much, how, how big this will be? 2%, 3%, 4%? Still, still, it is a long way to go. I'm sorry, I'm a bit negative about that, but I think this, this is a reality. Let's talk about uh, money and access to uh, uh, funds. Is it easy when we talk about renewables? Uh, it is uh, relatively very easy to, fi to, to finance uh, pure renewable projects, mm -hmm. uh, then depending on when you are, uh, and the size of the projects, but uh, it is relatively easy because there is a lot of money around. The problem is that uh, uh, you need to, 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 to face the problems uh, that uh, have been mentioned before. You need not only to invest in renewables, but reinvest, uh, take the, the energy that you invest, for example, in Northern Africa, uh, uh, all around the world. Uh, and let me just give you an, an example. Uh, imagining a, a, a strong path of transition in Northern Africa and the Middle East. Then you have a huge potential of renewables there. What do you do with these electrons? Because we, when we talk about renewables, we are talking mostly and, uh, let's say, more, more likely about electrons. Uh, the easy answer is uh, you, you should take those electrons and bring them when uh, there is the, the, the real markets, the, the huge markets in Europe or elsewhere. This, this is not that easy. We have some uh, hints of uh, developments. This is a, a debate that is, has been lasting for two decades, I, I think, about the power lines from uh, Northern Africa to Europe, etc. Uh, the only thing I, I would like to mention to, to give a hint of optimism is, is that uh, just two days ago there was a, an agreement to, uh, to, between Egypt, Greece and Cyprus, a, a, a double parallel agreement to uh, think about a power line mm. to connect the uh, renewable pro production in Egypt or in Northern Africa with the consumption markets uh, in, uh, in the north shore of the Mediterranean. So this, this is just a, a signal that uh, we should uh, look at uh, uh, carefully. But uh, uh, talking about uh, investment, then you need to be sure for those who are building this, uh, these pipelines that the renewables will be produced at a certain uh, cost uh, with governance that is reliable and uh, with a certain uh, agreements and uh, contractual models that are not, uh, let's say, very easy to, uh, to, to build uh, with such different players uh, uh, at stake. As, as a private sector, when you say uh, governments have to be reliable, what do you mean by that? 
Well, what guarantees everybody uh, should be needed. also <laughs> also private, private actors, of course. Uh, I, I mentioned before the intangible asset. Well, I, I'm sure that uh, in all the area area in the Arab uh, region, the key uh, issue about uh, uh, energy transition, but also uh, moving to the wider economic development is, is governance, more mm -hmm. than everything else. There is a huge potential in terms of uh, uh, transforming the conventional energy world, uh, investing in renewables, uh, combining renewables with other sectors of the economy that were me mentioned, uh, for example, Ambassador or that uh, run, but uh, governance is still key and is, is still, let's say, uh, on average is still uh, lacking uh, for most of the situations because you have uh, too much time for decisions, uh, uh, changing uh, uh, frameworks. Uh, and in this respect, I think that the European Union, apart from, uh, let's say, a, a weak uh, political role or, uh, let's say, a, in evolving political role, Certainly, we have in Europe the capabilities in terms of uh, regulatory models, uh, governance of the energy sectors that uh, should be one of the pillars of the cooperation, in my view. And uh, now I can ask Mr. Jamal Fakhro, what laws are needed or missing in our countries uh, to be able to fulfill what is needed? The laws? Mm -hmm. Well, the laws, laws without the will will not work. We can draft many laws and write them. There should be a will from the government, from leadership, that we want to change and we are able to change. Writing a hope, writing a white paper or converting it into, into whatever a green paper then would not make a change. But let's talk about the, the, what is happening in the whole world and the impact of that and, uh, and how the changes in the, in the globe is, are impacting us. You spoke about, about the green funding. Yes, the green funding is becoming really a major, a major, uh, a major uh, uh, way to fund, to fund businesses. Mm. Certain banks in the whole world today, they will say, I will not, fund, I will not finance you if you are developing your conventional uh, oil and gas, but I will do finance you when you go to renewables. That is, that is one of the ways where the globe can really impose the change. It has to be forced. Sorry? It has to be forced. It's, sometimes you have to force it. Sometimes, exactly like, like when, you have, when, you, when you sign the Paris Agreement, people go, countries go and sign it. They, they have to, to go to, to, uh, to enforce it through parliament and so on. It is again here, the, the, the global market is, is participating in enforcing the renewables. I will tell you, even companies today, and sorry, I just mentioned something about, about my firm, KPMG, we have, we have agreed two weeks back to spend $2.5 billion on helping our client or pr producing system and training our people to help our client how to, how to move into to, to implement the ESG policies. And the ESG, as, uh, as, as Mark said, the governance is a very important part of it besides the social and besides the environment. So even the companies are moving that way. Today, even companies would not, would not deal with others if they don't spend certain part get certain part of their energy from renewables. And I can talk to you about, about again about Bahrain. When we had one of the large of the large companies coming to Bahrain, they insist that five percent of their of their of their energy comes from, from renewable and we are helping them with that. So the global market is pushing. Countries who want to receive FDI have to do that. So it will happen, but it will not happen easily. It will happen. It, it requires lots of push from, from... Because of lots of challenges, including security in the region in general. Instability. How does it affect your work in the region? Mr. Marco. Uh, let me first uh, uh, complete the reasoning on, on, uh, on financing the transition, uh, if I may. Because... Uh, we are talking about the region, but in, in the transition and in the, the investment game and uh, green finance, etc. I think that uh, international oil companies, as the ENI is, uh, big companies, but also 
uh, let's say, producing countries in the region are game takers. The, the game, uh, we are on the eve of the COP26, uh, let's say, meetings, the game uh, has, it will be decided globally in terms of, uh, first of all, carbon pricing solutions mm -hmm. and uh, uh, carbon leakage. All this is a bigger game than the region by itself very important, crucial for energy production. But in this respect, it will not, let's say, decide the rules of the uh, energy financing for the future. Uh, and sorry for, for uh, diverting from uh, your question, which was on uh, political stability. Mm -hmm. When uh, I was uh, listening to the previous uh, panel, I was thinking, well, Politics is really complicated, uh, much more complicated than energy is. <laughs> uh, and unfortunately, I'm working on both. So, uh, combining energy and politics, uh, I would say that uh, political stability is, of course, affecting the company uh, as uh, you and I exposed to, let's say, all, all, all comparable risks. But in the end, uh, nobody would imagine that. Uh, uh, and I would uh, have stayed for ten, 10 years in Libya after the, uh, the, the, the civil war or, uh, let's say, other uh, regions uh, with uh, many, let's say, re let's say reasons for, of, of, con of concern. You're saying uh, that investment will go no matter what? This is what you're saying? I'm saying that, of course, we, uh, we, we consider the political stability, but we have also some uh, uh, knowledge and... Uh, experience for more than 60 years in the region to deal with uh, those um, those issues uh, of course uh, we, we we stay far from uh, open conflicts uh, but let me say that uh, uh, unfortunately the conflicts uh, uh, coming from uh, the arab springs and uh, all the related uh, um, developments uh, um, uh, are, in my view, um, uh, are, uh, let's say, even, even if uh, slowly, uh, are a little bit, except maybe for Yemen, but we will see, uh, slowly uh, reducing their intensity. Mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't be, let's say, more optimistic than that, but uh, let also recognize that we have lived uh, even much more hard times. And uh, let me also add that, uh, because we tend to forget uh, things that we thought just one year ago, we, we are on the uh, one, uh, 18th month of uh, COVID pandemic. In the first, I remember the very first days of the, uh, of the pandemic, people were considering scenarios of conflicts uh, arising from the pandemic. Mm. Do, you, do you see any conflict that, uh, that arose from the pandemic? I don't. I see financial uh, burdens that change okay, the priorities okay, but, of the uh, government. I, I tend to see also what uh, didn't go wrong. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, uh, 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 as a, let's say, observer, mm. could be uh, worse than than this. Yeah, I know. And uh, maybe Mr. Jamal Fakhru has uh, his points about mm. the positive side of the pandemic. The lessons <laughs> learned. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, before we go to the, to the positive side of, of the pandemic, I would just want to say that let's agree that politics and economics goes together. When there is a stability, there will be growth of FDIs. When there is instability, nobody will come to invest or very few who will come to invest. These are the opportunists and the high risk takers. And these, the high risk takers are really, the number of them is reducing in the market because of the difficulties they are facing. We have seen, as an example, with, with, with sheer gas, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, large companies go and invest. Today, they don't. It's only the risk takers will go to invest because they want to have a quick, quick money. On the, on the pandemic, no, I think, I think on the, the, the positive side, I will tell you, we are saving lots of wasted time in the past. If we, if we believe time, there, is, there is value for time, we are saving lots of, lots of time if by, if from the, the uh, commuting. Just, uh, just imagine when you used to spend an hour to commute from your house to your office, and an hour from your office to your house, with, with, with the usage of, of the gas for your car, for the transportation, and so on and so on. Today, you do, you do your work from home, exactly you start, if you start at 8 o'clock, you start, you, you wake up at 7.15, 7.30, you are ready to sit on your desk at 8 o'clock and start your work. In the past, 
You have to leave home at seven to reach your office at eight. Okay. So all that is saving. Use of technology, I think, I think the pandemic have forced us to change our mindset that we don't we don't need to be in our offices to be productive. We can be productive from home. The yeah, trust this is really interesting. No, but, but that the, doesn't yeah. hide the fact that the financial burden of, of uh, on governments and even on uh, private sectors affected them, and the priority now changed. Let's talk about the governments. The governments, their priority now is health. So where uh, renewables come when we talk about it, uh, and uh, uh, when it comes to private sector, uh, uh, with the financial uh, pressure that many companies had is it easy now to strike a balance let's say between being good and doing good at the same time marco uh, well first of all uh, good news is that uh, the reaction uh, on the pandemic at least in the uh, northern world was combined with the uh, awareness of the climate change. So, for example, the European Union, but also with different, let's say, flavors, uh, the United States uh, built their programs, uh, huge uh, public financing programs, uh, uh, focusing on uh, energy transition. At least one third of these was uh, in Europe is uh, about that. Energy transition and technology developments uh, which combine in terms, uh, for example, of energy e efficiency. Uh, then, uh, in general terms, the fact that uh, the pandemic will cause uh, uh, public deficits, uh, uh, shrinking uh, uh, public uh, finances, in, in especially in developing world, in the developing world in, in certain countries. Well, this is an issue, and uh, let me. Uh, say that the only solution is uh, is global cooperation i mean i don't see other solutions there is a debate ongoing moving from the washington consensus to the so-called new cornwall consensus which is more as uh, more about of solidarity having the the, the, the understanding that we depend uh, on each other. For example, the pledges on vaccines to be donated were about uh, 2 billion vaccines to be donated I wonder how many have been really donated, 300,000, about 10%, which is astonishing. I mean, and then we know that if the, uh, the pandemic will remain in the developing countries, uh, we will have this problem, we will have uh, effects uh, on, uh, on our economies. So, uh, talking about finances, we need to put, uh, let's say, money, those countries that have money, in the sound development of, of, of the other countries. But I'm referring not only to European countries, but also to wealthy yeah. Arab countries, of, of course. Yeah. I just want to say one thing here. I think uh, what Marco said about, about the global cooperation okay. is a real. It had happened. We have seen how, the, how the, the world was really moving away from cooperation that, that was built since the, the Second World War, especially in the last five, 10 years. With the pandemic, we see much more cooperation. Okay, okay, there might be some political agenda here and there. And answer, but, um, distribution but, but we, to the vaccine. But I need to ask you a quick question because we have only one minute left, Mr. Jamal. 30 seconds. Uh, okay, 30 seconds. The, um, did you sense the, um, the financial burden uh, on the spreadsheets of the private sector and the governments after the yes. pandemic? Very How big. hard? Very How big. huge? Very big, very harsh, and we will see We will see in the coming few months huge liquidations of companies. They'll be hurt. Yeah. Jabal Fakhro, thank you very much, and Mr. Marco Pereda, thank you very much. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the interview. Thank you for joining us, and uh, now we have a coffee break. You can no question and answers, but still you can meet my guests outside and uh, ask them whatever you want. Thank you very much. <laughs>